I'm going to be uh, uh, trying to emphasize in this presentation today how in not just my team, but how uh, people, the research science, the research community can use large population cohort data integrated, hopefully, with modern computational and genomic slash omic tools to address questions with regard to health. So I'm going to be highlighting the CANPATH cohort, the cohort I want, I'm, I want to emphasize that the CANPATH cohort is not my cohort. The Ontario Health Study is not my cohort. We host it, we build it so that you can get access to it and utilize it for your research, depending on the research questions that you want to use it for. Um, and the, I'm going to be highlighting as well three particular activities as well. So hopefully we can get through those three activities today, as well as highlighting um, the activities of CANPATH. So um, can, what is CANPATH? So before... We're going to set this up in the context of why do we build these large population cohorts? Population laboratories are important because, and they differ from, say, clinical cohorts or clinical trials because they capture, if you like, real world evidence. They capture information longitudinally from people. If they're consented, we can capture people like we are in Canada for over 50 years in terms of recontacting information, recontact information, and so on. So we can determine what factors contribute to the development of the diseases that I have on this slide here. Um, so for example, we know that one in two Canadians will die from a cancer or a chronic disease. Uh, one in two Canadians will be diagnosed with a cancer. One in 10 Canadians live with asthma or COPD and so on. So the point being though here is that we wanna capture not just who is developing these diseases, but potentially why they're developing these diseases as well. And that's where these population laboratories, and that's a term that Terry Manolio from the NIH first coined um, in, in, in her seminal review uh, is extremely well cited in this context. So CANPATH is Canada's answer to this. So CANPATH is a national population platform. We've collected and recruited many Canadians. One in 100 Canadians have consented to be part of this activity. Uh, and really, our mandate is to try to understand who develops diseases, why they develop those diseases, and also we're going to hear about this today, who's not developing those diseases, perhaps the healthy aging side. Who are the, those 80 or 90 year olds in our population that are not developing a chronic disease? And so that can only be captured in this kind of information. Sure, there are trials that go after those particular, those, those, those centenarians, if you like. Um, those are smaller population studies, but um, this, this is the kind of thing that we're thinking about too here. Now, I'm at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, so naturally we think about this also in the context of cancer. And we, as I just mentioned before, want to know who's developing these things, these diseases, um, and what the factors are, uh, because we also believe that if we can capture those cancers early, we can prevent those. We can, we actually are much better at treating and curing those diseases as well. So we just heard this is a great presentation that we had uh, just before my presentation about some of the tools that are in the liquid biopsy space. So you're going to be hearing about how we use population cores to develop liquid biopsies, as well as other things as well in the context of thinking about trying to capture these diseases at their earliest stages. Right. Okay, so this is CANPATH. I'm gonna be really quick and high level with this. This date, slide's a bit dated. We're actually at around 350,000 participants because Manitoba and Saskatchewan, you can see here, are our latest activities, our most recent activities, sorry, in terms of where we're capturing uh, 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 information about uh, those individuals and those provinces as well. Um, the lion's share of CANPATH comes from Ontario. So we heard during the introduction that we have something called the Ontario Health Study, which we lead out of the OICR as well. And two of those three projects that you're going to be hearing about today are largely coming from biologics and data from the Ontario Health Study. The information we're capturing, we capture information about from questionnaires. Uh, we capture, we invite people to uh, an assessment center where we might get a blood sample. We maybe measure your blood sugars, take a blood pressure as, uh, estimate or so, and um, and so on, uh, that falls under physical uh, measures. We do long-term follow up So we, again, in these cohorts, we have consent from our participants to recontact these people over many decades. And that reconsent takes two forms, either through questionnaires, but we also, to be part of CANBETH, largely we ask our participants to consent to link to administrative health records, um, wherever those might exist in those data hosting repositories in across Canada. Many of them are in provinces. We are very excited in CANPATH to be very close to signing, uh, we're at the signature stage actually, I'm not gonna say too much about it until it actually happens, 
a national activity where all that national data will sit at CANPAS so that you, the researcher, don't have to go to 10 provinces or some facsimile of that. Um, you go to one, a one-stop shop to get linkages to administrative health records to the questionnaire data. The questionnaire data is important. We don't want to de-emphasize that. Sure, who develops a disease is obviously critical, but you don't get from an electronic health record your smoking habits, your drinking habits, where you live. Do you live under a dry cleaner? I don't know why you'd live under a dry cleaner, but that, those types of information, those are the kinds of things that you capture from, say, the questionnaire data as well. Um, so from over 330,000 participants, we've captured all kinds of uh, information. We also captured uh, medical, not just medical histories, but medication histories as well. Um, I mentioned the anthropometric measurements. And again, we follow these people from enrollment to follow up. We're now, this year, going to be celebrating 15 years of CANPAT. So there'll be stuff happening about that in the media, uh, hopefully. And uh, we captured at least, I think it's actually, this is actually an underestimate. We're closer to 4,100 variables from each of these participants as well. Um, and this is just a quick snapshot of what that looks like. Um, we've had significant partnerships with uh, a number of activities. Sonia and Anne at McMaster has been great in supporting um, very important uh, data that we're capturing with CANPATH from about 10,000 participants. She's captured imaging data, including this number of potential First Nations participants as well. That imaging is largely functional MRIs from hip to top of head. Um, so again, that's a significant resource. It's not as much as, say, UK Biobank, which is captured and is capturing imaging data, but this is our footprint. And I just want to highlight, again, CANPATH is Canada's in, uh, uh, population cohort. And uh, there are there are other cohorts out there. Um, UK Biobank, I just mentioned a moment ago, is a half a million people. All of those participants have been genotyped and exome sequenced. Um, and these are just some other uh, cohorts as well. Um, one thing I want to highlight, there is something called the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium. I'm on the steering committee for that. To be a member of that cohort, you need to have at least 100,000 participants. The Million Veteran Study, for example, is another cohort. The All of Us program, both have a million people in them in the United States. Um, and to be part of that consortium, of course, you need to have genotyping either done or planned. We are anticipating right now in CANPATH, I want to highlight that we have about 50,000 participants that have been genotyped thus far. Um, so that's the largest uh, sign in Canada at the moment. We're hoping by the end, uh, we're very close actually, we think we'll have after a couple of years, um, all of CANPATH exome sequenced and partial uh, uh, and uh, whole genome sequence. Um, so that's all of the blood samples will be turned into genomic data, capturing mm -hmm. germline information as well. Um, this is just the portal for the IHCC as well. And we host this out of the OICR as it happens. Um, so one of the things I just want to highlight, and this is going to become important um, when we start thinking about developing tools or biomarkers for understanding who's going to develop uh, diseases, is that the way we're structured in CANPATH, we enable retrospective as well as prospective research. So sure, we can determine what happens to you going forward or by asking you questions or linking to administrative health records, but we can also retrospectively link as well. So uh, we can go back in time. We've got biologics, for example, before people have developed a disease, or we can go back in time and say, ask, you know, did you live under a dry cleaner 15 years ago and has that impacted your health? Um, and that allows us to do things like link to an important U of T project called CANU. Um, so CANU stands for the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium. I guess you can read it down here. Um, and what that does, it's a great activity led by Jeff Brook and sits at the Dalai Lama School. It uses information like, say, can pass six digit postal codes that we capture from every participant. And we can use that information to see, we know where you live and then link it to information like air pollution or uh, noise indices, or uh, how much green space there is in your neighborhood. And look at those factors in terms of how they impact your health as well. Um, and so we've used that information for one particular study where uh, in Quebec, uh, we published this in Nature Communication some years ago, we actually captured information about clinical information, did some work in the context of gene expression and genotyping, um, and asked, uh, depending on where you live, um, does that impact things functionally like gene expression signatures? And we were able to show that air pollution was the most important feature associated with variability in the population with regard to gene expression. And we actually mapped uh, EQTLs that were associated to how you respond 
to air pollution in this context. Um, we also have, just to highlight, uh, in can pet, um, things like uh, cytokines, uh, inflammatory markers, then we can look also as well at how inflammation is impacted by air pollution. And we can show very nicely that um, depending on where you live, which might impact your exposure to particulate matter, air pollution, PM2.5, has a significant impact on inflammation. Um, and that kind of information was used in this nature paper that appeared this summer to show specifically that air pollution drives potential chronic inflammation among people in a number of cohorts, including CANPATH, um, and is a significant risk factor for the development of non-smoking lung cancer, right? And so um, Charlie Swanton led this activity uh, at the CRUK, and he showed this not just in CANPATH, but other cohorts in BC as, as well, um, that, that, that uh, it actually acts like the second driver uh, infl inflammation in, in the context of developing these lung cancers. Okay, so that's an overview of CANPATH, um, and I've burned through, I don't know, 12 minutes. So uh, I'm going to go through really quickly some exemplars of how you can use CAMPATH for understanding and developing uh, tools in the context of uh, who's going to uh, thinking about the development of cancers and also in the context of healthy aging. So the first project I'm going to talk about is Nick's work, who's sitting in the back of the room. And it's great to have a preamble. It's not a preamble. It was a fantastic talk, but uh, but it was now I don't have to explain nearly as much as I, I would have had to before about some of these liquid biopsy tools before. So Nick's been working very hard for the past number of years on using the Ontario Health Study plasma samples, largely capturing those plasma samples or identifying who's developed a cancer in the Ontario Health Study by pulling those blood samples um, uh, from those individuals before they develop those cancers. So we're really interested in looking at developing a tool that can potentially go out into the population and see how early can we detect a cancer before a traditional diagnosis. Um, so self, as we heard before, self-free DNA um, can be, is, is used in a number of spheres uh, in terms of as a biomarker uh, for diseases. Um, anywhere there's damage in the body, and it doesn't just have to be from cancer, you could have type two diabetes, wherever there's potential damage, that's gonna impact cellular de degradation, and you may or may not see that signature in blood. Um, that, that just speaks to either damage or maybe in the context of cancers, increased cellular turnover, um, which might release um, uh, uh, in, uh, material into, into blood. So uh, we've been looking at, oops, I'm just gonna quickly go through these things. Um, a liquid bio, developing liquid biopsy approaches, again, using the material that we've captured in CANPATH and the Ontario Health Study in particular, where we have plasma samples captured before a person was diagnosed with cancer. So that allows us to see if the, any of these tools, like the tools we heard about earlier, can be used to detect that signature before they were diagnosed, maybe before a mammography happened, or in how many years can we go before that signature falls off. Um, so Nick's been working very hard on developing a methylation-based assay. Um, we like the methylation-based tools because they tell us something about tissue specificity, particularly when we don't know um, where that cancer may be in that pre-cancer space. You like to have the method. We know that uh, methylation is very tissue specific, so we could potentially use that information. Um, and so Nick initially started developing those tools in that context um, using data um, from TCGA. And I'm going to really highlight quickly here, again, that we did this from in starting in Ontario in terms of uh, pulling samples. And all this picture is trying to show you is in the Ontario Health Study, uh, where we have about 40,000 blood plasma samples, some number of participants in 2000, that were recruited largely in 2009 have now gone on to develop a cancer, right? So with our friends at Cancer Care Ontario, they gave us that information because we have that information in terms of, we have those identifiers, we send that information to Cancer Care Ontario, they tell us who developed a cancer, we pull those samples, and this picture on the bottom here is largely just an indication of uh, the numbers of samples and the time between when the blood was collected and when they were diagnosed, right? And so what Nick's done here is he's just kind of put a start time at zero. And so you can see that many samples, some samples were uh, just a few months uh, captured um, from a participant before they were diagnosed. And some samples for breast cancer were captured up to about seven years. 
Okay, and we bought that for, for breast, pancreatic, and prostate. And you, as you can see, the pancreatic numbers are fewer because it's a rare cancer, right? We don't have nearly the same incidence rates for pancreatic cancers. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working in this space. It's obviously a rapidly evolving disease. And what we really need there is a tool that can see that signature quickly so that a clinician can act quickly as well. Um, also information that we have captured from our participants um, yeah, from cancer care on Tayri data is information about stage, um, not just time of diagnosis, um, also uh, in some cases grade as well. And you can see here that the pancreatic cancers on, in general are more advanced. Um, it is a rapidly evolving disease. Uh, when it's diagnosed, it's, it tends to be diagnosed stage two, three, or four versus many of the breast cancers and prostate cancers because of our population screening programs, most of those cancers are captured early, uh, stages zero or one. And that's the information that we capture as well. So um, we've been using um, the MEDIP assay um, initially, um, and, and, well, in almost entirely at this point as well, um, to capture, uh, to see if we can see those signatures in plasma. And this is just a very superficial analysis here, but you can see here from these principal component plots that we're actually doing a pretty decent job. Um, and this is our first pass of the data, if you like, of separating controls from cases. And one of the things that I wanna emphasize here, here is that, well, we have a lot of information that we can pull for controls in the Ontario Health Study. Lots of people haven't yet developed a cancer. So we can be very much, very sophisticated in terms of how we do age, sex, matching of our controls. We can look at type two diabetes. If some of our, our cancer participants also had type two diabetes, we match based on that. We also match with other things like alcohol, BMI, and so on. Um, yeah, so you're seeing that in general, we're getting a pretty nice separation. And like we just heard a moment ago as well, um, uh, we can see that there's actually these methylation marks in plasma are doing a pretty good job in terms of capturing a breast cancer signature when we're looking at breast. Right, so, um, and in fact, they were able to separate luminal A, luminal B, and so on. Um, this is how well we're doing. Um, this is at our first pull of the data. We've done two pulls, and now we're in the process of looking at how well we can replicate. So our areas under the curve are around 72% here using uh, a, a tenfold cross-validation like we just heard a moment ago as well. So we do 90-10 splits, and we look at how well uh, we can replicate that. Um, actually, this pick, that box plot on the left um, is all our data together, both our first and our second full of data. And you can see that our principal components that I mentioned a moment ago actually do a really decent job of separating our controls from our cases. And this is all the data combined in fact. Um, one thing that we're able to do, and this is a really neat analysis that Nick was able to do, is we're able to see, is there a time where we see a signature of a blood, in blood, sorry, of that cancer when mammography may have missed it? And so that's what um, um, that particular um, uh, picture is trying to tell us is that in some cases we can see that signature where in the blood plasma that mammography where mammography didn't wasn't able to capture it. Now that's not to say that we should be replacing mammography. We're pretty there's still you know some sensitivity and specificity issues with these tools, but we think these things should be done in, in tandem uh, when we're looking at population screening. And uh, I, I would make, and I think the, the most recent stuff coming from Grail would also make that, uh, and their clinical trials in the case would also make that, would also make that case. Um, uh, yeah, we also did this this uh, this OHSP diagnostic test set is this what we heard a moment ago is we had a we had enough samples where we left out a number of samples and tested those markers and we were able to show that they work in that context. And um, yeah, I don't have enough time to go through each one of these slides. Um, it works really well with metastatic cancers, and that's not surprising given that those are a much more advanced stage of cancer, so the signatures should be higher in, in, those, uh, in those cancers. And again, this is what it looks like for prostate, which is actually doing fairly well. Um, and Nick's actually doing a lot of work in the fragmentomic space, uh, and particularly in prostate cancer, and of course, this is our pancreatic cancer. Um, last thing I'm going to mention really quickly, and only because uh, this is a bit superficial at this point, but... Last year, some of you might remember that the Canadian Cancer Society came, it came out with some, uh, not revelations, but some suggestions about alcohol and its risk associated with cancers. And generally, uh, the notion is that um, using, from those epidemiological studies, um, that two drinks per week significantly increases your risk for cancers. Um, so it's one of the things that Nick and I have been looking at 
It's can we see signatures because we have that information uh, of alcohol. Um, and actually we do not maybe, and we're still working on how it might be related to cancers, but we actually see significant signatures of alcohol um, in the, with these cell-free markers in both our cases and our controls. Um, and we also see other things too, like uh, we don't have time, but um, not sure we're gonna see smoking signatures, but we will also see things like uh, arthritis, these are very strong signature with these types of uh, uh, programs. Okay, so really quickly there, um, in the solid tumor space, I haven't talked about blood cancers yet, in the solid tumor space, just to highlight, these large population cohorts are large enough, like even just in Ontario, that we're getting significant numbers of people who are developing cancers that we can pull from them. And I would argue that these cohorts are better powered than say some of these massive clinical trials that are extremely expensive where people are being recruited and then waiting to see if they develop cancers or not. These people are already banked. Um, and uh, these are, we can retrospectively pull samples and ask questions about blood health as well. And then as I think, I think, um, as I think we demonstrated as well, um, this, the methylation signatures are, are, are telling us interesting things about who's developing cancers. Now, as you've got a sense, um, how are we doing for time here? If we started at 10 after there, we're well within time with the academic club. But anyway, my, my, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about blood cancers. Um, so if you haven't figured this out yet, CANFAT has collected a lot of blood, so it makes sense for us to look at how do people's blood age. Uh, and I mentioned before that we're interested in healthy aging, but we're also interested in these other evolutionary processes um, that accrue with, uh, with in blood. And as you all probably are familiar with, somatic mutations will accumulate in your blood over time. And um, this is just a quick plot picture of the blood cell hierarchy. And um, unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard about clonal hematopoiesis which is largely a process where somatic mutations will accrue in stem cells of blood and have a significant, can have a significant impact on health um, and is an important and a necessary feature for the accumulation, sorry, a, a necessary feature associated with um, the incidence of AML, acute myeloidopenia as well. So a process called, that's called age-related clonal hematopoiesis, and largely that is a process by which a somatic mutation might accrue in a blood stem cell. It, that somatic mutation may give a fitness advantage to that particular clone where it starts to take over. And by the time, and there's some studies that are, are suggesting this, that by the time you're 85, pretty much you've gone over the arched cliff uh, where you're pretty much one clone of uh, uh, because that somatic uh, that's probably occurred repeatedly and you're only left with very little clonal diversity uh, as we age. Um, so um, we're interested in that process and in part we can support that through these types of science because we actually have a lot of blood collected um, in uh, in our cohort. Uh, and this is just a paper. Uh, this is just a figure adapted from Jay Zoladell in New England Journal, which shows that th there's a. Uh, uh, where those somatic mutations occur matters. Um, if occurring in these particular genes, like DMT3A, TET2, et cetera, confers, can, is more likely to be associated with that clonal propagation process that I mentioned before, particularly TET2. Um, and uh, that, those are those, and those are specifically point mutations. Um, and so there's, a, there's actually quite a lot of work in that space as to, and we've done some evolutionary modeling um, also to try to understand that. I'm not going to have any time to talk about that. But there are also these larger mutations that can accrue. And so there's a question there as to why do larger mutations occur in blood? Why are they accepted? If a larger mutation by definition is likely to be, have larger functional impact, do those things persist because of clonal hematopoiesis or because of something else? Or are they just occurring neutrally with age? Right? So this is work largely by my former PhD student, Kim Speed, um, who's gone off to some company. And uh, largely, um, we're interested in asking that question. Why are these large mutations tolerated in our blood? There's already been some work done um, in the UK Biobank as well. And this a number of papers appearing in Nature um, looking at this uh, by folks like Alex Price and Stephen McCarroll. Um, their studies suggest that these types of alterations, these large chromosomal alterations or somatic mutations that are larger, accrue in people's blood about in 5% of the population, right? 
And um, so we're interested, okay, is 5% a lot? Do we see 5% in CANPATH? And if uh, do if not, you know, why not? And what are the evolutionary forces maintaining or removing that, those variants as well? So um, it, this is a picture for CANPATH. Um, so we genotyped about 14,000 people. And in fact, we've looked at this now in almost all the people we've got genotyped as well. And our numbers are slightly different um, than that of of um, UK Biobank, we, we argue that, in fact, it's around 8 to 12 percent um, of individuals in the population are showing these larger chromosomal alterations. Part of that, um, and these chromosomal alterations take the shape of losses, gains, or copy neutral uh, loss of heterozygosity. Um, and this is just a map. And one of the reasons we think that might be is that if you compare technologies, the GSA affymetrics arrays are kind of what was largely done for UK Biobank. They are lower density or genotyping arrays. They're not capturing as many things as what we're capturing with some of our more dense or more dense genotyping arrays in the uh, CANPATH cohort. Um, and you can see that here. And this is just a snapshot for some of those individuals. Um, we can see a much larger frequency. So density matters in this context. Your ability to how sensitive you are. To capturing these mutations is going to be a function of how dense the genotyping array is. Um, I'm going to be really quick with some of these slides here. Um, and actually, that's all this is showing you here is that these omni arrays, uh, which are the more dense arrays, have 2,500 markers on them compared to the GSA and the axiom arrays. And we're capturing um, not only more, but smaller um, somatic chromosomal alterations as well. So a more dense array means you're not just capturing the big ones, but also the small ones as well. Um, okay, so now we're going to ask is how is selection shaping this diversity? Are these mutations just occurring naturally or neutrally? Or are they uh, are these mutations um, being impacted by selection as you age as well? So one way we can look at this, and this is largely um, um, stealing from population genomics, with that notion that larger mutations should have some sort of functional impact, we might expect that sh there should be a relationship between size of a mutation and its frequency in the population. And if there isn't, then this is the scatter plot you might expect to see. So if there's no relationship between size and frequency, you expect kind of like a, a blast like this. Um, and this might be what the, the neutral expectation. What we actually see, of course, is a nice relationship between size or length of the chromosomal alteration and its frequency in your blood. Um, and we see this regardless of the array type as well. So um, uh, there is a nice negative relationship. So larger mutations are at lower frequency in your population. So clearly negative selection is having any some impact on removing those larger variants, right? Um, what Kim also did was develop a tool for trying to hotspot. Are there particular per, 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 uh, per, uh, places in your genome, this is because I'm trying to speak fast now, are there particular places in your genome that are more prone to these somatic mutations here? So what you see here are these spikes of chromosome two, there's something interesting happening. Chromosome 13 is a really well-known um, position in the genome associated with somatic mutations. Um, there's interesting things happening on sex chromosomes as well. And if you just zoom out to some of these things, some of these things actually over, so there's chromosome 13, which overlaps with the DLU region, uh, which is well known to be lost in a number of individuals as well. Um, but we also see that in chromosome two, for example, um, that there's overlap with some of those um, genes that I mentioned uh, earlier, DNMT3A and ASXL2, which have been found implicated uh, as being important for point mutations. So larger structural variants are also accumulating at those genes as well, and so they may also be impacting um, uh, uh, frequencies. And in fact, what we see is that the variation at those hotspot locations is actually higher on average, statistically, than other regions in the genome. That makes the case that maybe positive selection is acting on those mutations at those hotspot places. So I just made an argument that in general, there's negative selection acting on size, but at these hotspot regions, we may be seeing this significant enrichment due to positive selection, which would be the canonical signature for clonal hematopoiesis, right? A somatic mutation conferring a cellular advantage. 
Uh, lastly, on the on the arch side, um, how does arch impact disease? Um, very quickly here, we're showing some hazard ratios that you're getting some that the number of ha of somatic mutations has a significant impact. I mean, there's not that many samples that have that uh, fr uh, frequency of uh, only 18 individuals, for example, in this particular analysis had more than three somatic mutations occurring in their blood. But as you can imagine, it has a significant risk on cancer. But yeah, but um, uh, you know, the number of MCs, MCAs, you know, high ratios are five or 27 are quite massive um, in general um, compared to say what you see in like, I don't know, nutritional epidemiology or something like that. Anyway. Um, that's what all I wanted to say about clonal hematopoiesis. And the last thing I'm going to really highlight, and I'm not going to get into too much detail here, so nobody panic. Um, but this is really just to emphasize what we have in the cohort that can support this kind of work. We have lots of blood, um, and we're not just interested in who's developing cancers or disease, but we're interested in who are healthy aging people as well. And um, it's a great project by my former student, Alyssa, who's gone also to another company that will remain nameless, um, uh, has actually developed some great tools to try to understand who in our population are those are healthy agers. We actually, she developed a, 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 a risk score for a healthy agent based in purely on your blood profile. That included things like hematocrit, number of neutrophils in your blood and so on. It's extremely predictive actually, um, not in both in small cohorts as well as large cohorts. And we use that to select participants. Um, and you know that's the CRS, that's that risk score that I'm talking about. That's your complete blood count risk score on the bottom. Um, and the colors reflect the ages. So we were particularly interested in identifying who are our old people with a, a very low risk, who are our young people with low risk, who are old people with high risk, and who are our young people with low risk, and look at their cellular profiles as well. And so we did, and, and to do that, and we want to address a couple of questions as it relates to healthy aging. These were her questions. Um, and I'll quickly say that we were able to use this um, modeling to identify not a whole lot of genes that are associated with a protective mechanism versus a healthy aging mechanism, protective being defined as there's something different about aged, low risk blood. Um, um, supported by a few genes in your genome um, compared to um, healthy aging where uh, low-risk aged individuals are more similar to, to, to low-risk young blood. And uh, we think that, that there were there were thousands of loci that seem to be associated with that. Um, and so we, to do that, and I'm just going to say this is how we did it. We were able to pull blood samples, get find live cells, and I think this is the largest population cohort study of its kind, where we've done single cell blood assays for this number of people, which were about 400 people um, from a population cohort. Sure, there are larger studies. Uh, there's not that many larger studies that have looked at single cell um, individual studies that have done this uh, entire level of integration. But we were specifically interested in looking at single cell transcriptomics from high risk, low risk, young, old, et cetera, uh, to be able to map uh, a number of factors. And uh, this is a paper that's uh, we're uh, in revision stage at the moment. So in, in review, so we're pretty pretty excited about this as well. Um, and uh, just this just highlights some of the things that we were able to find um, in that. But in any case, um, if you're interested in these type of work and this type of usage of the blood samples, you know where to find them. And that's a good uh, way to start signing things off. So just this is my acknowledgement slide. Um, so CAMPAT is a partnership across Canada. I have a great team of, of, of leaders across the different provinces and here at the Toronto where we host this activity. Um, and they all have their, their teams and there are many funders that make this happen. There's been $200 million of investment in CAMPAT already. Um, and the last thing I'm actually going to really highlight is that, um, and I didn't get a chance to talk about these students' uh, presentations. You heard about my student, Tom, who's been working on image-based approaches. My student, Ido, you may have heard from already, um, has been developing a series of machine learning tools in the lab. My student, Uran, is using a number of vision-based tools, developing a number of vision-based machine learning tools as well, all in the context of cancer. So if there's anybody out there who's interested in collaborating with this wonderful team, uh, we'd be happy to hear from them as well.
Um, so just to put names to faces, this is the leadership of CANPATH that I just mentioned before. This is a very old picture of some of the people in my lab, but Kim's up there. She was working on the clonal hematopoiesis project. Alyssa was doing the single cell uh, healthy aging project. And Nick is right in between the two of them. And he's sitting in the back of the room and he was leading the, the cell-free DNA uh, cancer project. 